In August 1945, President Harry Truman signed the Agai Accords with the end of the Pacific War and a humiliating defeat for the United States. The Americans were forced to surrender Hawaii and all the other Pacific concessions to the Japanese, who had also signed... Summit is set. Uh, who also signed uh, perpetual leases on the port of uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. However, in 1960, President Eisenhower tore up the Agai Accords and resumed total embargo against the Japanese Empire, leading to a tense international standoff which uh, culminated in the Hawaiian Missile Crisis. Recent diplomatic overtures have caused tensions to thaw and open a path for negotiation for the Honolulu Accords. A new final settlement uh, to question the trade and sovereignty of the Pacific. America seems seeks to reclaim the treaty ports while Japan uh, desires the resumption of the crucial oil trade with America. The outcome of the talks will determine the political efforts both sides invested into gaining the upper hand in negotiations and talk could go very interesting directions should the negotiators think outside the box. So we're both at 2020. Nobody's currently in the lead. So I'm hoping that we could, if we can win, we might be able to dig ourselves out of this negative 600 political power pool. We'll see. Summit is set. The Japanese have set their over the... I've sent over their agreement to the location. We're good to go for the summit. Momentary look of relief emerged from the Secretary of State's face. We're swiftly disappearing. Now comes the hard part, President Lyndon B. Johnson said. We better get ready for the Japanese are going to want in exchange for giving our territory back. They want our oil, and they'll want to access to our markets. The Secretary of State slid a folder on over the President's desk. With everything that's been going on in the sphere, I can't say I blame them. President Johnson smiled, and that gives us leverage. <laughs> Hello! Hello, Professor uh, Swerver. Oh no, the Accords. The Japanese... Demand oil. Mr. President, we've started our negotiation with the Empire of Japan about the potential request, uh, reacquisition of our California ports. One big problem between our nation and the prosperity sphere is the fact that we do not trade enough. Because of this, the Japanese have demanded substantial amounts of oil to make up for the recent shortages. Simply put, the sphere lacks many of the oil reserves that we have here in the United States. Luckily, the Japanese diplomats seem uh, pretty desperate to sign a contract with us. If we grant some subsidized oil purchases, the economy of our sphere will continue functioning and we may, uh, we may regain our last lost ports. If we help with the Japanese and the sphere helps us out, we could see a brighter relationship between our two uh, great nations. We also have a chance of bringing American workers back to work for us. Now, the question of the moment, how much oil will we give the Empire of Japan? We could, could be get, uh, generously offer them a substantial amount of oil that they need. We could go down in the middle and offer them a moderate amount of oil. Finally, we could give them a small amount of oil, but they may not accept the offer. We also need to consider the Japanese plan to use the oil for. What do you say, Mr. President? You know what? Get as much oil as they, they need. We have a ton of oil. And really, I'm not worried. Like, if Japan wants to annex any of these people, like, they, I, I don't care. If we can have, if we can end this campaign with good relations with the Japanese and good relations with Spear, we've kind of, I think, created the best case situation we could possibly have in this hellhole of a world that we've, uh, that we currently reside in. The U.S.-Japanese talks begin. Many have noted the increase in diplomatic activity between Japan and the United States in the past few weeks. Today's speculation of the cause of the uptick was put to rest as the country has announced a high-level diplomatic summit to address the situation in the East Pacific. The stated objectives for the summit is for Japan to secure access to American petroleum, for the USA to secure the return of the treaty ports, and for both countries with their respective alliances to lift the mutual embargo and resume trade. Great hopes are already being pinned on the potential effects of the treaty for the country's respective economies and for the wider cause of peace in the Pacific and the world. I, uh, I will be on the summit as they try to na uh, navigate the maze, a competing interest to find common cause for a deal. So, I, I have high hopes. The Japanese want more. We received some unfortunate news, uh, Mr. President. The Japanese now request more oil than, than our highest original offer. Our diplomats have tried to convince the Empire of Japan that our oil offer was the best we can give, but now they demand more. We really thought the Japanese would be better negotiators than they turned out to be, but it seems like we're still uh, in the process of concluding the deal. We've come upon three options for a response. I'll either submit to the rather extorted demands and continue feel, uh, the feelings of goodwill, persuade the Japanese our original offer was enough, or end negotiations altogether and move to the next topic of discussion. We'll, be, we'll bargain for the original offer. We could give them a little bit more, but I feel like we gave you the most... We have negative 50 political power. Apparently we fit a negative 50. I didn't even know that. But currently the pool is zero. For facts of the original offer. Mr. President, the Japanese are escalating this oil offer far beyond what we uh, are normally capable of giving. These negotiations are becoming very irritating for our diplomats. It seems like no matter what, the Japanese are only going to accept the absolute maximum that we can give them right now. The greediness of the Japanese diplomats is utterly atrocious and, and is causing them, causing many of us to lose faith in the deal. Um, 
The greediness of the Japanese diplomats are the atrocious. Oh yeah, let's see. The deal. My colleagues and I asked ourselves: Is it even worth to trade massive amounts of oil for just two ports? If we face two more uh, options, Mr. President, we can either continue pursuing the Japanese original offer was enough, or we can submit to the empire uh, the empire's request. No matter the decision, we need to make sure the offer is in our favor. So I think negative fifty. I think actually adds fifty here. Japan's still in the league, but our offer, our original offer, was good for you. Okay. Like, just take it. We're now plus 25, so I'm assuming... I'm imagining Japan backed off a little bit. Civil War has erupted in Yemen. So we got the North Air Republic, and it's just re regular Yemen. I don't think you matter at all. A complete success. The trade deal between the United States and the Empire of Japan has finally be, uh, has been being finalized under days of proposal communication. It seems that both parties are getting the resources they really need. Uh, the United States will have its port San Francisco and Los Angeles um, uh, returned without conflict. The Empire of Japan will be given the oil grant that will help solve its widespread shortages throughout the sphere. The President and the Prime Minister of the United States and Japan respectively shook hands on the deal moments ago. No matter what, both parties hoped the negotiations would better relations between the two global superpowers. Workers both in California and the Japanese home islands rejoice that the nation has announced the completion of the deal. Though the trade deal was complete, the impasse United States and Japan still have work to do. Talks are supposed to carry on for the next few days, but one thing is for sure, there will be a peaceful end to these important negotiations. So yeah, you're still in the lead. I mean, 20, 75 political power, really, I don't think it would make a massive dent here. How long have I not selected an option? Okay, no, it's only been a few days. So let's reintroduce the idea of social security. Seems like an okay place for us to start. We'll also say some NPPC voters to our side. The terms of the trade. The Japanese representatives have laid down their terms to restart trade between our respective cities' influence. They propose a mutual end to the embargo, but have attached a proposal tariff for uh, pros tariff reductions to the agreement, which frames as a mutual treaty. It only names sectors where lowering a tariff favors Japan at our expense, making it very unbalanced in their favor. Our advisors are divided on the response, something that we should take a hard stance on the issues and demand an end to the embargo's free conditions, while others point out to the massive benefits of signing a deal compared to the cost of accepting Japanese com uh, conditions. We won't let them take advantage of us. We have negative 25 again. So here we are. We're sussing the second clause. Smiles all around. It appears uh, the end is in sight for trade embargo between the world's greatest economies. The negotiations for the ongoing summit between Japan and the United States have made an announcement this morning uh, that a deal will resume trade between the countries today. Signed has been agreed in principle to be signed later today. On both sides of the Pacific, brief hopes are placed on the economic benefits of the deal, and businesses are scrambling to take advantage of the new goods and markets to offer. So negative 25. If we reduce our current pool is 50. What if we make ours like negative 100 and they just inherit negative 25? Will that work? Does that make any sense? I don't know. Assessment of the teachers unions. One of the planned landmark uh, pieces of legislation President Johnson hopes to pass is the so-called Elementary and Secondary Education Act. While the draft is still rough, ESEA will increase federal funding for schools across the board, as well as focus on parental involvement in public education. While well, Alex in Congress crafts the bill itself and marshal congressional support to ensure the easy, easy, it's easy passage, the president himself has ele uh, elected to meet with the most powerful teachers unions in the country to ensure their support for his newest initiatives. One of the notable demands with the unions is relaxed federal control over the methods in which teachers may engage with students and teach coursework in the classroom. There's already been some strong opposition to such a proposal as it allows many dissident and un-American ide ideas to propagate among um, uh, young American children and teenagers in our school. Furthermore, promising such a form may weaken our support among conservative Democrats and as staunch as anti-communist and fascist. Otherwise, uh, others, however, uh, posit that it may be the next new radical step for allowing personalization of education tailored towards individual needs of the students and may overall improve the quality of education for our young people. Yeah, like, again, negative 25 political power. It is what it is. This is going pretty well so far. I'm glad to hear it. The third clause it is time to move on to the third and last issue, the treaty ports. It's obvious that to everyone that there's no real reapproachment between our nations that is possible while the Japanese occupy parts of American mainland. Um, with all the threats that imply, and the Japanese have indicated their willingness to return to ports. The specific of the transfer has been left to, uh, to the end of negotiations, and this will be the last clause up for discussion. We have a few options for how we position ourselves to approach these final negotiations. Apparently we're both all at zero at the moment. So that works out for us. Um... 
And this will be the last flaws up for discussion. We have a few options for how we position ourselves and approach these final negotiations. Our advisors fear that a straightforward transfer will be received in Japan as a loss of face and that politics uh, that the perception might jeopardize the negotiations. To avoid this, they say we should offer to demilitarize the port uh, upon transfer. By doing this, we will ensure the Japanese have something they can point to as getting in return, enabling them to transfer the ports without appearing weak. Others in administration consult the Truffer approach. The goal of the whole summit, they say, is to turn a page in a relationship with Japan and that can only be accomplished if they agree not only to the port transfer, but to demilitarize Hawaii. With the Hawaii military crisis in all too recent memory, they claim that the asymmetry of the mutual threat will uh, soon cause rise attention to back to previous levels as long as the Japanese garrison on the island chain. Our most hawkish council suggests we demand the demilitarization of Hawaii without offering to demilitarize our ports in return. According to them, this is the only solution the man in the street will accept, and thus the only way to prevent future resentment from souring relations. What? Okay, you know, okay, so... These are both, this, these both say the same thing. This is, of course, not going to succeed. So, well, I'm going to go take the second option. America's currently in the lead for the first time. America number one. We're doing it. We'll, we'll demilitarize our ports. You demilitarize Hawaii. And, and I feel like that is, that's... Come on, that, that's acceptable. Those are, those are good terms. We'll, we'll make some more tanks because tanks are cool. Uh, Oman is also now in a war with you. And I don't, I don't think there's anything we can do. They're insurrection in Oman. The Stonewall bus. It all starts... It starts with a sudden blackout. 205 patrons on the stone wall stop and stare in the sudden dark. It's 1.20 a.m. outside. And a bartender's reach for panic buttons as they try to calm their customers. The four undercover officers curse as they fiddle with their switches. And the lights flicker back to life. The few who realize what's about to happen begin pushing their way through the crowd, but the moral squads have already locked down the window exits and are marching through the doors, flashlights in hand, as they bust the biggest gay establishment in New York. The raid doesn't meet uh, with a receptive crowd, to say the least, as officers lead those in women's clothing to the toilets. Uh, may resist. Uh, many resist. It's common knowledge that those who get arrested by the moral squads as cross touching men don't make it out without bruises, spit drenched faces, manhandling. Men with faces lean and caked on with makeup wrestle with their cuffs and spit on their captors. None of the bar's patrons have made it this far in the world, uh, with, uh, which mostly despises them without getting a little rough around the edges. And when the men pushes them around, they push right back. By the time the raid concludes, around 150 people are under arrest, but many more are gathering in the late night darkness of the Big Apple, and a storm is brewing that cannot be contained. Hello, your boy 444. The Dofa Rebellion is declared war on Oman. Sure. We shall overcome. The greatest LGBT riot in the history of the United States begins as a logistical problem. The moral police have grabbed 28 cases of beer and 19 kegs of hard liquor, but with the patrol vans occupied elsewhere, there is nowhere to put it. Instead, they, they keep the patrons on lockdown as the wagons arrive. Far too slowly for, uh, for a police operation, the patrons, of course, are understandably upset, and those few not under arrest quickly join the growing crowds gathered around the building. Many of them know that once the end dies, so too does the living, breathing heart of the gay culture in the greatest city in the world. They have everything to lose. As Mafia members and patrons are loaded into the wagons, many still struggling, a lone voice breaks out, We shall overcome. A protest song written for the South African war finds receptive ears in another angry crowd facing an another unwinnable fight. Uh, growing cheers, uh, growling shouts of gay power echo from the crowds, which have swelled to bursting the streets. Storm Delevee. Falls to the force struggling against four officers, and all hell breaks loose. Records are unclear exa exactly what happened next. In a wave of anger, the mob pushes over police wagons, throws bricks at the officers retreating into Stonewall, presses garbage against the broken windows. Many of the most repressed members of the gay community lead the riot. The drag queens and the street boys uh, leading a wild, wild charge. Sylvia Riviera, notable drag queen, will remember as the greatest night of her life. And the doors of the inn are broken, open with a battering ram. Officers inside prepare for a fiery last stand, and then the police trucks arrive. Fuel to the fire. Japan has negative 10 political power. You're loose in Japan. Kick lines and tear gas. The initial reaction was one of rage. Officers bloody and coated with garbage and interact with violence and the fairies did it. The fairies. The violence explodes in the streets as police officers take the law into their own hands and hammer their rage into defenseless. Onto the defenseless. The mob arrayed uh, against them far too gone to care. They form the rough outline of a cabinet chorus line and began to sing. Their voices are piercing to late night and the police have had enough 
uh, being needled. They rush the line. Men and women get hammered with Night 6 as Bedlam spreads the surrounding streets. Crowds run around police officers laughing gallantly like warriors in, a night of, in, in the light of burning cars. By the time the riots come to a halt, Christopher Street is blocked. Half of the cars have been overturned and every garbage can for a mile has been emptied onto the street. Witnesses describe an odd beauty to the refuse zone, the refuse strewn seats, like a river of broken toys. Of course, the streets aren't the only thing broken, breaking the news. All throughout the next raid, crowds grok at the now at the, sh at the burnt out shell of Stonewall. And when the next night comes, they're joined by songwriters, poets, activists, and tourists washing down the streets in the tide of exuberant energy. Alan Ginsberg notes on the way back, uh, the guys uh, there were, be, 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 that the guys there were so beautiful, uh, they've lost that wounded look that Fags had 10 years ago. Don't know why, that last paragraph like broke my brain. Complaints of federal overreach. Though Head Start has proven pretty popular among both the general populace and among policymakers at every level of government, President Johnson has come under increasingly assault by conservatives, uh, many even within his own party, to, that accused him of tyranny that has overset his bounds for his plans to greatly expand the mandate and scope of the federal government. Several Senate governors, backed by their state legislators and support for numerous federal congressmen, have demanded that the president guarantee certain privileges in education that will belong to the states and the states only. In an effort to stem the tide of what they have termed increasing federal overreach bordering on federal tyranny. The president's supporters, as well as the northern liberals, have urged Johnson to push forward with this program. Criticized, be damned. Thus determined as ever, President Johnson has continued to forge ahead on his legislative agenda. The southern democrats and conservatives generally within the party are not too pleased. We're going to go more divided. We're going to lose more political power. But as it is what it is. So, like, how are we doing here, then? Yeah, scroll up. We're now weak on healthcare. That's a slight improvement. Agreement has been reached. After several long days and nights spent in negotiations, our delegation has delighted to inform us that they've reached a comprehensive agreement with our Japanese counterparts. As they toast our success, our bright policy experts are poring over the pro proposal claims, perfect, uh, perfecting wording and ensuring consistency between English and Japanese translations. Soon it will be time to sign, and not long after we hope we'll finally have our territory back. Our success to this, uh, to this clause bodes well for the outcome of the whole summit. One step closer to a comprehensive treaty. So right, we have 20, we've invested 25. Japan has negative 10, currently in the lead. The Yemen Arab Democratic Republic is at war, has defeated Yemen in a war. I mean, that seems good for us. I mean, you're authoritarian democracy, but yeah, I think that's still better than nothing. Got the Dofar Rebellion. Can't imagine any of you guys really have. Any. You have four divisions, five, seven. How how is Spain doing? They're still technically at war with Morocco. I don't think they're ever going to be able to actually land across the uh, across the the sea there. The treaty ports return. The announcement of a comprehensive treaty between the United States and Japan has been greeted with optimism in most of the country. Uh, through the last week, a speech were held and paper signed. The, pro the promise of a more peaceful future seems at last a reality. And a profound sigh of relief has passed through the nation. Tension has been uh, felt uh, by our people for over 20 years. has been finally losing its grip. Today, as the Treaty Ports of Los Angeles and San Francisco passed back into American hands, the atmosphere shifted to one of celebration. All across the country, everyday life has given way to port, po uh, to port parties, pulling whole neighborhoods out into the street in celebration. The biggest crowds of all have been seen in Treaty Port cities themselves. In San Francisco, cheers from the gathered thr throngs drowned out the voices of the Japanese ambassador and his translator as the last Japanese flag was taken down and a stars and stripe holstered in its place. Surprises evidence among the Japanese as well as the sailors abroad Shikuma found themselves cheering goodbye to the jubilant crowds as scowls and jeers they had come to expect from Americans replaced by cheerful smiles and waves. Pictures of uniformed Japanese smiles and waving back to the crowds are now making rounds of television in both sides of the Pacific. Truly, it feels like a page has churned on Japanese-U.S. relations. So, an end of an era. Replace daring to dream with a new dawn. Political power change goes up. More recruitment population. More stability and support. Hawaii, Shoto becomes the demilitarized zone. San Francisco, Los Angeles becomes the demilitarized zone. Gage House Spirit, t US underscore TV underscore Jap underscore middle underscore oil. Consumer good factor 10%. Fuel gain for oil minus 10%. So yeah, you get oil. We create 80 import. I guess that's chromium. Trade relations increase. Gets event one more proposition. Will gain a lot of support for a great victory. An end of an era. I guess you guys are now just going to just hang out outside of Los Angeles then, I guess, at this point. 
You guys can hang out in San Francisco. Trade with Empire of Japan has been terminated due to low trade influence. <laughs> oh, just immediately, huh? <laughs> okay, then. One more proposition. Honolulu Accord 71 description. Sure. Sure. Just, just immediately, they're like, nah, fuck you, get out of here. Uh, okay. So apparently there's a second round of negotiations, though, so we'll see kind of how that goes. Why is there boats just in the middle of the ocean? Please, you can't land here, obviously. Go to this port. We are missing chromium. So the 80 chromium we were supposed to be getting from Japan are, are just, like, not there anymore. Well, I guess we'll trade with South Africa. <laughs> Uh, Serbia has side with Italy. You're doing pretty well for yourself, Italy. Like, I thought we were doing pretty well, Japan. They cleaned our territory. We have negative 40 because I'm assuming because um, cause of uh, Hawaii here. Which should now be demilitarized. We own... Yeah, we own Panama. Round two. Not days after the uh, righteous celebrations in Los Angeles, San Francisco, the foreign minister returned to Washington, D.C. under President Johnson's personal invitation. The visit official intent was a tour around the American capital, a show of goodwill capitalized on the momentum of the now-named handover success. Unofficially, while the old man had his suspicions, he thought them confirmed when he entered the old office and saw the president back turned, inspecting a large canvas map of Hawaii. The minister uh, drew a sharp breath as he took his seat, stealing, stealing himself for the last conversation he ever wished to... You confront in his career. I trust the accommodations here are to your liking, President Johnson asked, without glancing back. The foreign minister grunted in, uh, in assent. So the foreign minister is our foreign minister, right? I'm imagining so. Um, not exactly proper decorum, but he figured the silence meant the president didn't care. Good. Leather shoes clacked with the polished lineum as the president shuffled back to, into the resolute desk, pulling several folders out from his cabinet. He spread the stack across the surface like a dealer with a stack of cards. Each folder bore proposal in red capital letters across a tab. Uh, wouldn't you want to keep you from seeing these? So I'll keep this brief. We've had some nice ideas for your government's consideration. We'll discuss these more. Oh, no, so it's a Japanese foreign uh, minister. As quickly as he arrived, the minister left the office escorted by his assigned guide. When he eventually inspected the president's ideas and put the form, what he was drawn most to was well, measure proposal for Hawaii's entry into the Union. Unconditional, okay, probably unconditional is going to fail immediately. Exchanging the Panama Canal Zone for Hawaii seems like just a horrible trade. Imagine negotiations on, over Hawaii's re-entry into the Union. We're going to get Hawaii back. Hopefully. Or they might immediately say no. Well, we'll kind of see. You've also immediately killed Orenberg. You're still fighting these guys over here. So Japan, our, our first one went pretty well, even though immediately after you canceled our trade agreements. No national focus set. We have no political power, so we can't do some of these things, unfortunately. Stability plus 2%. The influence of conservative rhetoric will reduce, okay. The counter offer. They want Panama. President Johnson anticipated the uproar with his hand held up. Uh, like it were lid on a seething cauldron. Ten silent, ten seconds later, he lowered it back onto the table. Any objections, the president said. A handful shot up from their chairs. The Secretary of Defense and the Joint Chiefs shared um, cherry red faces, ready to launch into a tirade against the cabinet chiefs diplomats. Only the president and voice demand kept their presumptions lodged firmly on their throats. He glanced at the Secretary of State, nodding. The sweating man... Uh, wrong his snugly fit tie for reiterating the missive from Tokyo. The Prime Minister offered a suitable uh, equivalent exchange for territories between the two countries, rightful American soil for a strip uh, of leased Panama area property. To uphold peace in the Pacific Rim, he also proposed demilitarizing Hawaiian islands and its adjacent waters. Left unmentioned was whether or not the same applies to the Canal Zone. After a moment of del deliberation, the President said, Hmm. Yeah, Japan wants Panama in exchange for Hawaii.
for a bit of Panama. So we can either enter negotiations for Hawaii. Do you have any... Okay, let me just, let me just take a look. Do you have any resource in Hawaii? You don't. You have 765,000 manpower. I mean, you, you are the canal. Dude, yeah, like, we're not going to give up Panama, the Panama Canal for Hawaii. I really don't think that is a good uh, offer for us. Like, it just seems bad. Like, the Panama Canal is way more... Like, how strategically important is the Panama Canal compared to Hawaii? It's like a trillion times more important. Okay. So, conservatives protest Social Security. Um, opposition to the Social Security Act has been become the latest on battlegrounds for the divided American legislator. Attacks and criticism against the Act from factions in both parties have become a near daily occurrence. And the officer refused the president to amend his piece of legislation, starting to draw considerable consider uh, consternation from the Democratic wing of the RD party. Privately and ever more publicly, the president is being accused of putting his personal agenda before the party and endangering the alliance at the core of the Republican Democrats. Across the South and their strongholds in the rest of the country, the far right faction of the NPP has is announcing social security. In even clearer terms, according to them, the act is an overt attack on the American middle class and a subsidy pay to the Negro by the white working man. Uh, their strategy appears to tie Social Security to the issues of civil rights, and according to the reports uh, trickling back to Washington, it seems to be working. Many previous Democratic districts are becoming uh, are beginning to lean on PP. This morning, the governing party was rocked by the news of a handful of lawmakers, including three senators, crossing the aisle and officially switching to the NPP. While their move is condemned by both wings of the RDs and a radio show of unity, there doesn't seem to be any more defections in the immediate horizon. This is a powerful reminder of the fragile structures underpinning Johnson's coalition. Democratic wing of the party grows more prominent, we're going to lose 50 political power. But, you know. Yeah, apparently, Nightbot did not like your spamming. 